it's not about what's best for the community. It's not about what's best for the workers. It's mm-hmm. about corner the market. It's basically killing competition. Industry-wide, an estimated 7,000 pharmacies have already shuttered in the last five years. Walgreens just this week announced 1,200 of its remaining stores could soon close. And Rite Aid filed for bankruptcy last year. So this is another variable that I forgot to mention, but I'm glad it was mentioned in this video. Is that another way is by growing their market share so that other companies are no longer able to compete. So then they have a larger market share, which also increases the profits. On top of that, because they let go so many people, well, then they can operate on a skeleton crew, meaning that they have less people doing the same amount of work of a full crew. This goes into the whole issue of quiet hiring, which I will also get into that in a little bit too. But ultimately, now you have one company or two companies that own the entire market. And so then if things like their quality control, customer service, and all these different things, if they fall by the wayside, well, where are you going to go? You can't go anyplace else. How many of you have went to CVS and uh, you've noticed that you may have to wait a little bit in line? You may have to, uh, you know, lines are a little bit long. Things just are a little bit more ghost townish in a way have you noticed i've noticed so here's the thing um one of the things that i wanted to share and i usually share this after the fact but i'm going to share this before the fact because i would like for people to see receipts cvs is now under fire from their workers for them not giving them a living wage them not giving them what they need. Uh, so one of the first things I want to show is who owns CVS? I want to keep this in mind. So this is directly from CVS. This is their investor page. And I want you guys to look at who the top, let's, let's look at the top five. Largest shareholders, Vanguard, Dodge and Cox. BlackRock, Capital World Investors, State Street, Capital Research Global Advisors, Geo Capital Management, and Fidelity Management Research and Company, you know, going beyond the top five. But it's always the same people. It's always the same perpetrators that actually own a piece of everything. And so when we talk about these corporations, you're always going to see the same culprits. You're always going to see the same greedy overlords that really just own everything and really just want to exploit the most out of workers. This is no surprise. You guys have seen me talk about this on this channel many times. You know, I don't want to do this explanation ad nauseum, but you guys know that, of course, when I'm going to say, what's the issue? What's the really big problem? It starts with a C. You know, if you guys don't know what that C word is, you guys can ask inside the chat and ask your classmate. But you guys will eventually find out what I'm trying to say. But the thing is, is that, you know, corporations like CVS, CVS, Caremark, Ultimately, what they're about is profits. For a company that prides itself on providing medication and pharmaceuticals to the people, should the goal be profit first? Well, we're going to see what profit first actually does for other people. 
and then I also will be sharing about why giving a living wage is the best course of action with a little assistance from a very wonderful colleague and comrade. But let's go into this video really quick and then we will react. So this is out of More Perfect Union. It says, new, CVS is the second biggest healthcare company on earth. But many of us ph pharmacy workers are on public assistance. CVS made $8 billion last year and owns Aetna, yet it doesn't provide workers with affordable healthcare. So workers are going sick to a pharmacy. It says they owns Aetna. Yes, the same company that participated in slave ownership. Aetna, that Aetna. Seems like their prime objective still hasn't really changed in the last 150 to 200 years, has it? Well, let's get into it, folks. And shout out to More Perfect Union for this. A lot of people have to go on Medi-Cal. A lot of people have to get insurance through the government. If you're a healthcare company. You should be able to do something. You own Aetna. You own Caremark. There's no way you can't tell me you cannot find a way to come up with a package for your employees. CVS owns one of the largest health insurance companies in the country. But 64% of CVS workers in California don't have employer health insurance, according to a survey by their union local, the UFCW 770. It's crazy enough that we're underpaid, but now you have to put a large portion of your, your, your pay towards your health care, where people now suddenly have to decide, do I want to have health care or do I want to put food on my kid's table? CVS workers in Southern California went on strike on October 17th. After six months of negotiations, the union and CVS have reached a tentative agreement that would address many of the issues we heard about from workers. But CVS employees all across the country will continue to experience these issues and worse. CVS has gotten cheaper and cheaper. All they've been interested in is just keeping their profits. CVS made $8 billion in profit in 2023, yet many of its workers are on public assistance. Of the many issues at play, none is more painful or ironic than the unaffordable employee health insurance plan offered by CVS, the second biggest healthcare company in the world. Sorry, let me first of all, let me pause there. It's kind of funny how, you know, a lot of times people will cry about how much we're spending in this country uh, when it comes to uh, the entitlements, right? Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security, and things like that, right? But if you're so mad at that, then why aren't you upset at corporations like CVS that are pushing people to be on public assistance in the first place? Why aren't you upset with them? And then the same people will get mad when we propose to give people a living wage. Well, if you raise the prices and everything's going to go up, baby, it has been going up. It, it, it's no different. The wages for federal minimum wage is still seven and a quarter an hour. And so if we're paying this much for basic necessities, then ultimately, does it really, does it really matter if they, if we increase the minimum wage? It does matter. The issue is, is the greed of the corporations, because the, the price is going to go up regardless, unless you ring them in. And you can get mad and say, well, that's regulation. But the thing is, is that regulation can also help and save people's lives. Here's my thing. If you get mad about companies price gouging, things getting way too expensive, don't cry about regulation. Don't cry about it. 
because it's the regulation that actually, you know, some regulation is actually good for us to make sure that companies don't go beyond the pale and start exploiting us. But that also means that you can't have a government that is beholden to the corporations. They have to be beholden to the people. This is what happens when you have the government that's beholden to corporations and it's clear in the in the in the tank in, in the pain for the corporations. So yeah, let's continue. Do I have insurance through CVS? No, I don't. So I have it through uh, government assistance, through, which is Medi-Cal. It sucks because it's basically there's times when I know I'm sick and I know I need the medication or I have an issue, I have a, a pain or something. I, I can go to the doctor and I can have that remedy fixed easily. But I can't do it because guess what? I don't have a health insurance. Hang on. Let me ask you something. Let me give you a scenario. When I was a line cook in the food industry and I'm at work, would it make sense for me to be at work as a line cook and I'm starving or I'm very hungry and I can't partake of any of the food while I'm at work? There should be contingencies in place for the budget for your workers who you know are hungry to at least get something to eat while they're at work, right? So shouldn't that same contingency be put in place for workers who, if you literally own a health insurance company to give that health insurance at least at a deep discount to your workers? The problem is, is that companies like CVS, they do not want to do this particularly because they have to tailor their company to the shareholders. It's never to the stakeholders. It's never to the, the, the people. And so then who ends up suffering was well, your workers. And the funny part about it is it's like you guys don't, they don't realize that their workers make the company. And if the workers aren't doing good, then what does that mean for the company? It just doesn't sit well. That greed is, is a horrible thing. It really is. Going to urgent care is going to cost me a couple hundred dollars. Getting the medication is going to add, that's going to add on to the price. The company has two separate and unequal health insurance plans. A more affordable plan for A stores and a more expensive plan for B stores. What's the difference? Nothing really. Workers at stores CVS bought in 2007 to 8 are A stores. The ones that came later are the B stores. That's it. We even asked them about it. It's like, can we, you know, get the health care into one, one health care? And their response was, no, it's not reasonable. It can't happen. Part of the problem workers face is CVS's dominance of the pharmacy market, which gives it power to push poverty wages, skeleton staffing, and unsafe conditions at retail pharmacy stores. Even as it closes stores itself, its sheer size allows it to dominate. That is what we call monopolization. That's what it is. And monopolization is a byproduct of capitalism. People can say, well, that's not capitalism, that's cronyism. Cronyism is a byproduct or a derivative or a piece of capitalism. You cannot replace it. It is part of that system. That's like saying that, well, That's not a carrot, that's beta carotene. Beta carotene is inherently inside carrots. That's just the way it is. It's a piece of it. That's part of it. You know what I'm saying? You, you know, you can't, a leopard can't change its spots. That's how it operates. And when it comes to companies like CVS, 
the CEO has what you call a fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders. Fiduciary responsibility means that they have to make profit year over year. No matter if it's a little bit of profit or a lot of profit, it still has to make profit by law. By law, they have to do that. If not, then they have a, you know, the means to vote them out of the CEO position. And so ultimately, in order to increase the amount of profits that they have, they have to do a few things. One, which throws customers under the bus, is increase in prices. Well, sometimes they know that customers also, in a sense, vote with their, their wallets. And so if prices go up too much, then vote, vote well, not voters, customers are going to walk on out and go to the competition. So they can only do it so much. Another thing would be to increase... Um, or I should say decrease the amount of stores that they have so that that also increases the amount of profit share that they have, which limits the amount of stores that they can have, which also means that a lot of employees get hired and fired. There's also the decrease uh, in wages or the suppression of wages, right? So then now you have employees like this that do not have uh, the living wage that they need in order to be able to survive, meaning that a lot of these workers are either going to have to work a lot more extra hours or they're going to have to get another job someplace else. There's also cutting of corners. Cutting of corners could be the cutting of benefits. For instance, they're not able to get the benefits that they need in order to be able to work properly. They're not able to get the health insurance at a reasonable rate because <laughs> apparently we believe that health insurance should be through your employer in this country, which is wild beyond me. And then they'll cut things like safety measures, regulations. They'll try to get regu regulations cut in the government so that they won't have to spend as much money on safety regulations and things like that. And so there's all these different cost cutting measures that they do in order to be able to make more profit because of that fiduciary responsibility to the shareholders. And so then once you have that, then everything else goes by the wayside. That's when the exploitation comes in because the exploitation is absolutely necessary in order to increase profit year over year. Capitalism is a system or it requires infinite growth on the planet with finite resources. So therefore, you need to grow year over year, no matter what. That's just how it is. That's ultimately the way it works. Because the rich have to get richer. Which means who has to get poorer? Yep, that's the way it works. It's not about what's best for the community. It's not about what's best for the workers. It's mm -hmm. about corner the market. It's basically killing competition. Industry wide, an estimated 7,000 pharmacies have already shuttered in the last five years. Walgreens just this week announced 1,200 of its remaining stores could soon close. And Rite Aid filed for bankruptcy last year. So, this is another variable that I forgot to mention, but I'm glad it was mentioned in this video, is that another way is by growing their market share so that other companies are no longer able to compete. So then they have a larger market share, which also increases the profits. On top of that, because they let go so many people, well, then they can operate on a skeleton crew meaning that they have less people doing the same amount of work of a full crew. This goes into the whole issue of quiet hiring, which I will also get into that in a little bit too. But ultimately, now you have one company or two companies that own the entire market. And so then if things like their quality control, customer service, and all these different things, if they fall by the wayside, well, where are you going to go? You can't go anyplace else. 
Oh, well, you're going to go to Walgreens? Well, they're just like us. You're going to go to Rite Aid? Well, <laughs> they're declaring bankruptcy. Want to go to Eckerd? Well, <laughs> CVS, we own Eckerd. You know, it's so that's basically the system in itself. So when people talk about, oh, no, it's not capitalism, it's cronyism, baby, it's all the same. You know, that's not potato chips, that's potatoes. That's not potatoes, I'll grotten this potatoes. You know, it's like trying to separate, it's like trying to separate, you know, uh, French fries from potatoes. It's like capitalism, cronyism, and cronyism is capitalism. Oop. What did I just do? Oh, no. Did I just? Oops. Sorry. I just took down. My apologies. I accidentally closed the tab. No worries. We can get it back. Mm. Sorry about that, guys. I think we're And I hope I was able to explain that very clearly, by the way. My apologies. To the government, your health care worker to push poverty wages, skeleton staffing, and unsafe conditions at retail pharmacy stores. Even as it closes stores itself, its sheer size allows it to dominate. It's not about what's best for the community. It's not about what's best for the workers. It's about corner of the market. It's basically killing competition. Industry-wide, an estimated 7,000 pharmacies have already shuttered in the last five years. Walgreens just this week announced 1,200 of its remaining stores could soon close. And Rite Aid filed for bankruptcy last year. You have basically a few mom and pop pharmacies in there. And the sad thing is they bought a lot of those out. They bought up so much stuff just to basically to take away all the competition they could. It's unfortunate when these pharmacies close because these customers have to go, you know, to the next store over. And what ends up happening is these customers spread to the nearest stores and then the workload increases. So the pharmacy, it's always hectic. They, they want us to do like a million things at once, basically. We're working with one hand behind our back and CVS is basically trying to see how many people they can actually cut down to to make the most profit. They profess how much they care about the patients, but they don't give us the time to actually give the patients the care that they actually need. The issue plagues front of store staff too. Being understaffed uh, frustrates a lot of the customers. They would prefer to come in, get their stuff and get out. However, so many things have been locked up due to theft that customers are forced to wait for somebody to come along with the key to help unlock that product. Do you guys see what I see? These are typically given to people who have diabetes. Why are diabetes supplements kept under lock and key? It's food supplements. Things like Boost and Glucerna and, and Sure. For people who may have a uh, an issue when it comes to, uh, you know, hypoglycemia or somebody who has low protein and they need a protein drink, right? They're kept under lock and key. Why? Well, because people steal. Why do people steal? Are we all just kleptomaniacs? you know, just itching to steal? Is that what we are? Or is there a reason why people feel the need to commit theft in stores like this? 
Fact, most people who commit crimes commit crimes of opportunity, lack of opportunity and desperation. And so in order to, I guess, keep their profits going, they have to make sure these things are locked up so people won't steal them. But if people actually made a living wage, if the cost of living was actually at a decent rate, then the amount of theft would actually go down. But then that means that companies like CVS would make less profit, even though they're already raking in the bill right now. It's quite sad. And oh, by the way, try going into the black hair care section in some, some stores. The black hair care section. They'll have all types of stuff that are made for us and our hair locked up what? Locked up and locked away. They even do the same thing for baby baby formula. Why? Why in the world you think? All right, let's continue. But there's not enough people in the front store working. A safety is a big concern as well. People who come to the store to steal, if they are called out on it, they will go violent. I've seen my coworkers be shoved. I've seen my coworkers be like almost punched in the face. It's ridiculous. I don't ever feel safe at work. I've never felt safe at work. My particular store has been robbed three times in the pharmacy. The first time I was there, they were remodeling and my store was robbed and I was held at gunpoint. I mean, I'm not completely 100%. I'm never going to be the same because of that happening, you know? A full long weekend on strike forced CVS's hand. I'm, you know, just your basic, average, everyday, ordinary, run-of-the-mill, ho-hum fella who just happens to work for CVS, be a member of a union, and live in one of the most expensive cities and be living under $30,000 a year. I think if I were even earning slightly more than that, I would have a bit more pep in my step when it comes to both workplace and life. We're willing to fight for safety. We're willing to fight for a livable wage. We're willing to fight for what we need in, the, in order to survive, you know? So when you hear of workers talking about safety, I would say that a livable wage and improving the cost of living is actually a public safety issue too. A lot of times when you're increasing the desperation for people, that makes their neighbors less safe. Because now if people are more desperate, they're more likely to do some heinous things in order to survive. They will rob and steal, among other things, in order to keep their head above water. But that's because you're creating a system where desperation becomes more of the norm. This is why a living a livable wage is actually safer for people too. A lot of people don't talk about that. Let me share this as well because I want to give some credit. So Sunday. My RBN comrade, Savvy Savs, she actually did a cost of living report out of the Community Church of Boston. And this was a piece that I didn't get to share on Sunday, but I wanted to share here because she she knocks out of the park here and she takes us home. So let's get in. So getting back to this point here, what caused this and how do we solve it? We need to start with the minimum wage. The federal minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. Remember, this is the least amount that you can pay someone by law. Minimum wage increases have been made through the states. We've had them here in Massachusetts. 
But according to the outer reach report that I just showed you for 2024, a $15 minimum wage at this point is not enough. When was the last time that the minimum wage was increased? Let's take a look at the history of increases of the minimum wage. This is from the U.S. Department of Labor. In 1996, there were amendments that increased the minimum wage to $4.75 an hour on October 1st, 1996 to $5.15 an hour, September 1st of 1997. Then we want to fast forward here to 2007, second paragraph. The 2007 amendments increased the minimum wage from $5.85 an hour, effective July 24th, 20, 2007, and then $6.55 an hour, which was effective July 24th in 08. And then $7.25 an hour, which was effective July 24th, 2009. Ladies and gentlemen, the minimum wage has not increased since 2009. It is 2024. So one of the things that a lot of people forget is that the minimum wage is really the wage that you can pay people by law without getting in trouble. Because if that law wasn't in place, well, then companies would be paying even less than what they could. When a company's paying either, either at or near minimum wage, you're basically saying, I pay you less if I could by law, but because the law is there, I have to pay you this much. That's what it basically is. Because we don't trust companies to actually do right by their workers because they have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders, meaning that they care more about what their shareholders get than what you as a worker get. So let's continue. So let's pretend it did. If the minimum wage increased every year since then, that would roughly put us at about $15 an hour. That's where the $15 comes from. But according to that out of reach report, a $15 minimum wage at this point is not enough. There's a picture there of Professor Richard Wolf because even Professor Richard Wolf would tell you this is not enough. The problem with the minimum wage it, is that it does not adjust for inflation. That is the piece that a lot of people do not take into account. Not only are we getting paid less, but the dollar amount does not go as far as it used to back in the day. So the ratio is off as well. So a dollar in 2009 was worth more than one dollar today on top of us also making less than what we should be making. So that's the issue. And when we talk about a living wage, a living wage goes beyond just a minimum wage, right? Because back then, when it was originally put in, I think it was under FDR, a minimum wage was actually supposed to be a living wage, but we've divorced ourselves from that in this country. So I'm going to let Savvy actually take this a little bit further. So what should we be discussing? A living wage. Mm -hmm. A minimum wage versus a living wage. The minimum wage is the least amount a worker can earn by law. Right now, that's $7.25 an hour. But a living wage is based on the cost of living and would prevent families from entering poverty. Mm. We have to change our focus. Mm -hmm. I noticed throughout the years, and I'm guilty of this as well, we continue to discuss the fight for 15, we need a $15 minimum wage. But what we're doing is we're fighting for the least amount a worker can be paid. We should be fighting for more. We should be fighting for a living wage. So we have to change our focus. 
We have to stop focusing on a $15 minimum wage and start focusing on a living wage. And you can see in the picture here with a living wage, notice the scale is balanced. As long as we are focusing simply on the, the minimum wage, we're, we're going to continue, excuse me, <laughs> to have a problem with poverty in this country. Because again, the minimum wage does not adjust for inflation. So that's one of the reasons how we got here as a society. This country. So because of that, this is why you have corporations like CVS that continuously pay as close to a minimum wage because then they get to extract more from their workers and keep more of that profit at the top for the shareholders. Because of course, the fiduciary responsibility means giving more to the shareholders, even at the expense of the workers. This is why you have a lot of workers that are now on government assistance at CVS. And you can apply this to many other companies, right? You can apply this to companies like McDonald's. You can apply this to companies like Walmart. You can apply this com to companies like Starbucks. It does not matter. It always means that they try to extract as much out of the workers to keep it in the hands of the people at the top. Because we're so focused on a minimum wage and we don't focus on a actual living wage, which also automatically adjusts to inflation. So then my dollar in 2009 will still go as far as my dollar in 2024. So with that being said, this is why we need to stand with the workers and push for a living wage, a livable wage. And I will also say this, this also includes livable incomes for those of us that are either elderly in retirement or those of us who are on disability because that also pours in over to those of us who are disabled and those of us who are elderly. And so now for somebody who's disabled like myself, disability benefits do not go nowhere near as far as they did back in 2009, because guess what? Inflation does not keep up with the cost of living increase that you get from social security. So we're actually doing worse now than we did years ago. So once you start giving paying somebody a living wage, that becomes a systemic thing. When you change it into a living wage, it becomes systemic and it starts to influence everybody's standard of living, including when people start to make more and have a living wage and they're not getting into poverty, then guess what? Crime rate drops. That's just how it goes. Crime rate drops. On top of it, it, if people start making more of a living wage, then guess what? Then they're not suffering as much. And then also your business starts to thrive more because people are more likely to go and shop at your business. People are more likely to buy from you and buy more from you, which also means that you get to char pay more of a living wage to your workers, which I personally think that they should be a work cooperative or worker owned business anyway. But even if you are an employer, once everybody else starts doing better, you start doing better. And that's just the way it goes. So it really is a benefit for all. But CVS isn't interested in that because, well, like a lot of other co corporations, they're greedy bastards. Thank you so very much for watching my channel. And I deeply appreciate it from the top and bottom of my heart. If you wish to support the channel further so I can keep bringing you content that is educational and informative, you can become a patron on patreon.com forward slash jbfond. You can find that link in the pinned comment or in the description below. No matter what you give, 
you'll be supporting independent media and education that helps make the world better. Thank you so much. And you can watch more of my content here. Mwah. Forehead kisses and have a beautiful day.